everyone. Welcome to our webinar on Ono. Oh My banker has asked for a cash flow budget with Denovan Ellis and Tom Gable from Rabobank. My name is Kate McCarthy from Northwest Local Land Services and I'm a livestock officer. And today we're going to touch on cash flow budget, budgets and um, how they can be useful for your enterprise. So at Local Land Services, um, what we're trying to do at the moment is engage in a variety of ways, including webinars in the instance of COVID. It makes it really useful um, way of providing information to you guys. So hopefully you, you'll find it useful. This is the second time that we're doing this webinar um, due to tech technology issues when we were running it live. So um, hopefully we'll be able to share this across um, various forums after this. So um, I'm really appreciative of Tom and Denovan's time in doing this. Um, you guys won't need to worry about this as we're not live. Um, yeah, so we had really positive feedback when we ran it live um, in the first instance. So we, we, we've we taken the time to, to do it again and, and hopefully it's of value. So thank you, Tom and Denovan, and um, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves from here. Thank you, Kate. Well, if we're going to introduce ourselves, Denovan, I'll introduce you and you can introduce me. Sounds good. So Denovan Ellis. 30 years with Rabobank. Uh, we had, I know that because we had his 30-year uh, celebration about September, October last year, so he must be nearly coming up 31. Tom passes when you're having fun, yeah, Tom. That's yep. correct, that's correct. So, Denman, very, very experienced manager, previous branch manager for Rabobank in Tamworth um, um, and is now holds some of our senior accounts here in Tamworth, um, has a farm south of Tamworth with his family, um, very tuned to the area, knows his cash flows very well. <laughs> so I thought he'd be the best man to, to, bring, to talk on this subject. Denovan. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And introducing Tom Cable. Tom is, he introduced himself once to me as Tom from Ty Bundy. So it's from Baraba uh, and has previously worked in, been in banking 10 or so years uh, and worked in the Northern Territory and Queensland and in Tamworth for approximately a couple of years now. Um, so we have a, a great team of people here and uh, we've got the job of um, having a chat to you today about cash flow budgets. So we might just touch base before we go in, Denovan. Um, <clears throat> I do remember some of the answers from some of the questions that Kate asked uh, on the webinar on the Thursday night. Yep. So um, I believe 73% of the people attending did complete cash flow budgets, um, which is more than what we thought. That, it, that was more we sort of thought, perhaps 50%, so that was, mm. that was so, very good. So sort of a 70-30 <laughs> split. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah our, our pick was 50. So if 70% if of the people doing them, that's great. Um, and 50% of them visited them either quarterly or six monthly. So updated them quarterly or six monthly. Um, and 25%, so the next 25% uh, would revisit on an event-driven occurrence, i.e. drought or change mm. in seasons, frost, hopefully not. Hopefully not. Yeah, so basically, you know, in a normal year, you'd hope that you could do your budget and it would work out more or less like you think, but um, with our variable seasons that we've, uh, that we've uh, experienced, uh, yeah, definitely re revisiting perhaps two or three times a year has been quite normal. So. so hopefully our voices won't be muffled uh, today as we re-record this and it'll be clear and succinct. Uh, it's our second crack at it, so we should hopefully know what we're talking about by now. Uh, so we're going to go through a couple of things today. Um, first of all, what is a cash flow budget? So we're just going to go through the basic equation of what we do, a cash flow budget and what's included. Um, the reasons for doing a cash flow budget, so um, some of the objective reasons as to why you need to do them these days. Um, and then we'll, and then after that, we're going to go to some of the benefits um, for a cash flow and also some of the limitations. Um, so that'll take us about 30 minutes. Um, and then we might go through, I think at the end, I'll, I'll sort of show a livestock schedule for the next three years to sort of do some work on income liquidity um, in a livestock program. Um, um, and I think that will be us and we'll, that'll lift us up. Okay, let's go. So, Denovan, <coughs> what is a cash flow budget? Well, I guess if I was to define what a cash flow budget is, it would be looking at all the sources of income, less all the expenses, 
um, spread out over a 12 month period, um, including financial costs and drawings to work out what your underlying profit or your, or your cash surplus is. Um, but more importantly, uh, because we're spreading, spreading it out on a monthly basis, we can uh, work out where the peak funding requirement is. So some people might have cash, but I guess a lot of farmers also have uh, overdrafts or debt uh, in running their businesses. Um, and so just working out where that peak debt is, is a critical part of a cash flow budget. Um, yeah, it's an important thing to recall or remember that uh, you've got to allow for cost of living in your, in your cash flow budget. So that varies a lot from family to family and depending on age and stage of life. Um, but it is really a cost that has to be uh, yeah, has to be nominated because otherwise, you know, you could be making an operating profit, but you don't have any funds left over to pay for living costs. Yes, yeah, that's right, Benjamin. So if we were, if we wanted to look at the farm profit, um, it would be under the the financial expenses line in this equation here before drawings. Um, but you always need to allow for drawings and living costs because you have to feed yourself, you have to send your kids to school, you have to pay your tax. Um, um, so. Make sure that you always include that and, mm. and, and be be aware of that figure and what, what that does cost you every year to live. That's right. Um, so farm expenses, Dan, and what types of farm expenses do we have? Yeah, well, really, there's two types of expenses. And the first one is fixed costs. So that could be your accountancy costs, your rates, your insurance, uh, all those costs in your farm that don't vary from year to year. So even if you didn't plant a crop or, or um, shear a sheep, you, you've still got those costs. Um, so you must think about them as um, the first thing you've got to cover in your business. Um, and then secondly, you know, your variable costs. So some of that, you know, you might work those variable costs out from um, gross margin analysis. Um, but it, yeah, obviously those costs are going to vary depending on how, me how many hectares you put in or how many livestock you're running. So um, and that's uh, important to distinguish between the two. Um, so once we get to underlying profit, then um, what do we do next? Yeah, so then, then, well, hopefully after all those costs, after your income and all those costs, there's a, a profit left over. And then, then you get to a level of expenditure I'd call more discretionary spending. So it could be extra repairs or property improvements like new new fences or it could be watering points or it could be uh, items of a capital nature which in many cases are still tax deductible but they are really quite um, more discretionary so uh, and then you might have also capital inflow so you might have redemptions of farm management deposits or you might have um, maybe an inheritance form or something like that mm -hmm. coming through. Um, or an inheritance pay payment out. Then. That could be the case. That's right. So uh, allowing for succession planning. So, and that, that, that the bottom line there, cash surplus deficit is how much money after all those discretionary items uh, coming in and out is there left over at the end of each year. So, that's, um, I guess that's... Mm, that's our equation. Mm, that's the equation. So, e equals mc squared. Think, uh, <laughs> so some of the reasons why we're completing cash flows these days, Denneman, or why we always should have completed cash flows? Well, as I said, I think the most common reason your banker would want a cash flow is uh, to work out your peak debt. But I, I think, uh, or in banking we call it liquidity, um, but it's also something, of course, as, a, as an owner of the business, you really do want to know. You want to be able to plan ahead, Tom, don't you, hmm. and um, work through... When, when, how much it might be and when it might occur, I guess. Yeah, or look at your, your current lending limits or current cash balance if, mm. if you, you know, if you don't have any debt, which is a good instance as well, as to do you have enough cash to get yourself through the year or do you have enough for headroom uh, in your current facility to get mm. you through the next 12 months of trading? Yeah, no, exactly. So that's that's a key reason and, uh, and obviously to work out um, which I think is another point there. Are you actually making a profit? Are you making cash? Mm. Are you generating cash at the end of each mm. year to um, to do something with? Is there more cash in the bank at the end of the year than what there was at the start? Mm. Yeah, definitely. So next one, post drought funding requirements, Denman, especially very, very current at the moment. Yeah, definitely. Um, Tom, I think you, you put it well, like a lot of well-established farmers 
and farms um, in a normal year can just say, well, I think my peak debt's going to be in November before the crop comes in and it's probably going to be about this much. Mm -hmm. And they intuitively really know where their business is at. Um, mm -hmm. But, of course, um, when we've just had two years of drought, probably two of the driest years on record uh, in our northwest New South Wales area, um, all those all those uh, normalities are thrown out the window, weren't they? So, exactly. We're um, running half stocking rates. We're rebuilding stock numbers. We're, 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 um, we're putting a crop in on, on borrowed money that we've never had to borrow before, hmm. or the cash from the previous crop isn't there to pay for those crop inputs. Um, so all of those things that have happened normally year in, year out for most farm businesses in the last 10, 20 years, even in other dry times where we've seen drought, um, you know, they're nothing compared to the last two years that we've been through uh, and, and a lot of big shifts in businesses. And the other thing is, um, if you're looking at restocking, is the cost the cost of the of the animal mm -hmm. that you're bringing back onto your place. It's, you know, it's three to four, you know, three times the cost of what it has been in the past. That's right. And I think on top of that, um, cropping is a little bit simpler because you spend the money in a year and you get it back in a year, hopefully, uh, and, and make a profit. But with livestock, when, when our clients are um, reinvesting in stock to get back to year-on-year -year levels of carrying capacity, um, they have to perhaps do two or three years of budgets. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's correct. So, exactly. It's not going to happen in one year. Yeah. Um, so what else, what are the other reasons why we're doing a cash flow budget, Denovan? We did touch on this before, but underlying free cash in the business. Um, so we might just pass that, but yeah, are you generating cash, not just a profit? Um, yeah. Which is an age old saying, you might look at the profit line and think you're making a profit, but you wonder where the money's gone. Um, and typically for a farm business, if you're generating profits, uh, but you have no cash in the bank, you're probably spending your money on capital items. Um, that are not claimable um, in going onto the balance sheet, um, but that's probably just one point. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the last reason, and one of the reasons, <coughs> the, the title of our cash flow was um, your financer has requested one, Benjamin. Why? Why are they asking more for them these days? Nasty bankers, really, aren't they? But um, I think the thing, Tom, and, and, and probably a lot of people know this, but in the um, Royal Commission into Banking and Financial Institutions. Um, it was pretty clear that public expectations is that bankers will not just lend to customers to make a profit, they've got to lend in, in the best interest of the client uh, or the customer. So that means that um, you've got to be able to prove to the bank uh, by evidence uh, that you can service the debt um, and not have the bank prepare the cash flow budget mm. so that they can claim that you can service it in. And that's a, a subtle difference. Um, sometimes people do it jointly. There's a conflict in interest. Banks are there to lend money and they get paid to lend you money by the margins that they charge. Um, so if they're, if they're preparing the budget for your, on your behalf to lend you more money, um, there's a conflict. That's right. So it is a conflict of interest. So therefore, a banker should be asking you to provide information and, and most likely a cash flow budget to show what you think you, your funding requirements are and to show that you can service the debt. Um, and it's putting that aside, it's, it's still not a bad habit to have, is it? You own the business, you you receive the benefits or or if it's bad, you're the, the adverse side of the of the budget, but it's um, you owning the business a bit more. So. Well, if your bank is asking you for a cash flow, he's not, he's not just saying, you know, you just roll in your eyes and say you need to complete a cash flow. What he's also asking when you present it is how well you understand your business. Mm. You're you're showing what in what cash or what finance you need for the next twelve months mm. within the cash flow, and it's also showing that um, what profitability your business has and what it generates and what you think it can generate too, rather than what they think it can generate. And they they have a view, they form a view, but they need to know your view mm, that's what right. the capacity of the business is. Yeah. So there's a there's a there's a um, it's a good practice for people to have, but it's also an obligation of banks to request you can provide evidence of, of your situation. So I'm just going to go through a quick little cash flow template that I notched up um, the other night, and we showed this the other night as well, um, just to talk through some of the things that Denner and I have spoken about. Uh, so if we go up the top here, so this is uh, a cash flow budget for a mixed... Farming operation, a beef and 
cattle operation. So we've got some cattle income here in the top um, and crop income down here below. So we've got 400 hectares of wheating and uh, I think it's 100 cow, um, cow and calf operation selling the progeny uh, to feedlots. Uh, so we've got the years um, in this here. Uh, we picked July through to June. Denman, why, why do we sort of yeah. go towards that? So it's important to recognise that a July to June period isn't necessarily the production year uh, for, for a crop. So if you were growing winter crops, you'd, you'd pick a calendar year most likely. But the point in here is that um, when you do a, a financial year budget, you can then revert back to your previous financial years and compare your costs. And, and does that make sense? Like, have you allowed enough for those overhead costs for the rates and insurance, the little things that you always, we always forget? Um, and yeah, so you can compare like with like over time and, and test your budget Mm. Uh, with your past costs. Yeah, so it's not it's it's not mandated that you do a, a a financial year budget scenario. We like to do them that way because then we like like Denham said we can compare your past performance um, to your current projection. Uh, but if you if you find it easier to run a budget a calendar year budget because that encapsulates um, you know your your growing season mm. um, by all means do it. But just be aware of when. When you're building your, your costs in behind it and you, and you refer back to your historical financials to use those, that you take an average over a three, four or five year period um, so that, so that you know, you're quite clear because sometimes, you know, obviously some years you'll pick up the previous year's crop expenses. One part, you might have a big plant, you might have a big harvest or you might have a, a big harvest and a little plant. And things like repairs and maintenance where you might have, before the drought, for example, you might have been spending a lot on repairs and maintenance, which was really property development. Um, but going into this year, you might be less likely to do that because you're really trying to get back on, get, get your feet back on the ground. So, yeah. Um, so you've got to look through those. Yeah. So there's the income. Um, so in this in this scenario, um, one of the partners works off farm. So it's good if you're putting in all your living costs into the bottom of the budget that you bring in all your income at the top so that you can look at your whole operation. And most of the times uh, we're looking at family businesses um, and it's good to put the whole operation in there. So this this particular instance, um, the partner's earning $2,000 a month off farm. Uh, and then we've got our expenses. So we've got stock expenses. Uh, um, and it actually, I did actually leave those steer purchases in there. So stock, ex stock purchases, uh, which we would say is a variable cost, Denovan. Yep. Ad administration, um, which is a fixed cost or overhead, so all your admin costs, so we've deemed them a fixed cost because they don't change year on year. Um, whether you've got no crop or no stock, uh, this, will, this will still be a cost to you. Uh, overheads, uh, once again, a fixed cost. Livestock costs as in dips, drench, marking, fodder, freight, selling, shearing, gentlemen. Yeah, all variable costs. Variable and cropping, insurance, seed, fertiliser, harvest, fuel, chemical, consultancy. Uh, and then we've got our financial costs, um, financial expenses. Yep. So bank interest as well as uh, equipment finance costs would yep. go in there. So yeah, in this instance here, I've got a um, 35 grand payment coming out in December and January, uh, June, sorry. So six monthly payments. And then we've got the client, uh, we've got the farmer paying monthly interest. So then we've got our total expenses and that gives our operating surplus. So in this instance, um, the operating surplus is 22,388. Um, so that's our farm operating surplus. Because um, as we've got here underneath the line, we've got our drawings. So our drawings, which are living, personal, school fees, taxation, um, all those things that, that you require from the farm business throughout the year, uh, you need to put those in there. So the underlying profit that Denim and I would talk to um, would be underneath this line. In this instance, there would be a negative in here. However, I am just going to take out some cattle purchases because I put them in last time. Right. So let's have a look here. Yeah. So this is a 100 cow operation and it's got full progeny from the previous year, so it's not rebuilding from a drought. And there we are. Farm operating surface 146. Um, drawings 48, so we've got a underlying profit of about 103,000. We have no costs, we have no no capital expenses in there or discretionary spending, as the gentleman likes to talk to. Mm. Uh, and then underneath this, 
and we'll just bring it out. Uh, the big line that, de that um, Denim and I will look for is your opening balance. So in this in this scenario, the client's got a, a million dollar limit. Um, that's his. That's all his debt. Uh, we will say in, um, different banks have different setups. You might have multiple loans in one bank. Um, at Rabo, we just do. We just have one loan. We call it the all in one, um, and it's your overdraft and your term debt. Uh, so it's all together. So we just look at peak debt. So the client has a million dollar limit, and they've got a drawn balance uh, at the first of July of nine hundred seventy five thousand dollars in debit, Benjamin. Yeah, and then um, cash flow gets a bit, a bit tight, doesn't it, in mm. October, November there? Yeah. Um, so we've got, um, as the client um, goes through, through before his harvest um, or cattle sales, um, we've actually got the client going over his balance here in August, or definitely September and October, uh, coming back in under November and then blowing out again here in December, January. Uh, and then and back underneath again uh, here through till June. So he's got a ninety-eight thousand dollar for the year, um, but within that year, uh, his peak debt. So his peak debt is actually a thousand at the end of January. So if we weren't to change anything around this, as in income timing or expense timing, uh, which the client could go and do now, um, you would say that to to operate throughout the year in a liquid position, they need another sixty thousand dollars on top of their current limit. Yeah, and I think that I mean you could arrange with a with a creditor or your contract harvester or someone to fund that, but we always think that it's more important that you use your bank as your banker, not your creditors, because when you're trying to re-engage that contract harvester um, next time around, he'll be a bit less likely to want to come if he's had to wait six weeks to get paid or whatever it is. So really think that it's um, important to, you know, pay your creditors on time, then they'll give you the best deal they can the next time mm -hmm. and uh, for whatever it is and use your bank for your funding, not not anyone else really. Um, it's uh, the best practice. Yep. So just a couple of other things to this cash flow template. We've got a cattle schedule, so we build a livestock schedule into it um, and the sales, we've got the sales coming in um, and they're reflected back in the farming income and we've got a crop schedule here as well. So we've got our... In this instance, we've got 400 hectares and we're actually selling the crop um, in halves. So we're going to sell half in June or well, half in February um, and half in June um, the following year. So yeah, in, in this instance, we could um, potentially sell some of the crop at uh, harvest time and that would make a material difference. So we sold it in November or December even. Or let's say let's leave it November. Early crop, it's feeling quite warm at the moment, gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, makes a material difference to the um, to the farmer's peak debt in this instance. So the peak debt is now eleven thousand, or actually twenty three thousand, uh, here at the end of September. Yep. So that's pretty much the nuts and bolts of the cash flow, isn't it, Tom? It is. I think I think that's that's enough time on that, gentlemen. I think so. But um, so it's just that you can see that we we like to distinguish between. Your normal operating costs mm. and your normal income, yeah, and what is more of a capital yeah. nature, yeah. One of the key things when you do any cash flow is splitting these costs up so you know which ones they are. Like if you're building, you know, your finance costs into your administration, or you don't, or you, or you don't have your livestock costs or your cropping costs out. Well, then, I mean, you can still change them, but it's a lot easier if they're grouped together. You can say, okay, well, the crops costs are down. Um, you know, it should affect this category. Mm -hmm. Overhead costs, they're not going to change. So you know your overhead costs straight away. You know your fixed costs for your business. Yeah. Um, finance costs, you know what it's costing you to yep. finance the business for the next 12 months. No, I agree. All right, Damon. So we talked about the reasons why we do it. Um, um, let's sneak through this. What are some of the benefits that we see in doing cash flow budgets? Well... <clears throat> I think we can see by that picture a very unruly paddock of subtropical grasses, uh, which um, underutilised. Underutilised. So um, if we had a bit more capital, we might have said, "Well, let's buy a few cattle in January or February when it started raining, uh, and um, put it on that subtropical grass and, and convert it into protein." So I think access to capital and working out how much money. Your, your, your business requires, but also have some free access, mm. some, some surplus funding available to take advantage of opportunities. Um, it could also be, Tom, that you want to store your grain for longer and, and maybe market it at a higher price or 
could be that you want to uh, keep your steers for longer, put on another 50 or 100 kilos on them. So um, having the flexibility is really critical and um, and, having, and having that organised in advance so that you can um, act promptly is a key. So in that, in that example there, we were looking at that farmer's cash flow and where his peak debt was. Um, so the next level on top of that is to say, well, you know, was there an opportunity to buy 100 steers and bring it into this operation and look at that and see how much money you need and go to your lender and say, well, I might not do this, but if I had another $120,000 available in my mm-hmm. limit, I could pull the trigger on that when it comes due because by the time you do your cash flow budgets and get it into your bank and get the application done to get the finance, mm. um, it looks like Denovan's paddock there, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but you might, not choo- you, choose, you might not choose to do it, um, and there is a cost to capital, but it's the access to capital and the profit optimisation that Denovan talks about. So taking hold of those opportunities when they do mm. come through. And you, know, and you might look at it and look at the market and say there's too much risk in buying steers at this price anyway, but it's the, it's the opportunity to do it. And it's also the planning. Like if you if you know what your core costs are and how much you need to run the show, uh, how much debt you need, but you, you, you've got more confidence in working out when these cheaper mob of cattle come along or whatever it is that you can actually act on it um, and, and you're much more uh, in control of where you think you're at. So, yeah. So assessing underlying profitability of the business, Denovan, year in, year out. Yeah, so the cash flow we just looked at was perhaps the cash flow just for this year post drought, let's say that. But that may not be representative of your normal cash flow. So a normal, what we call a year in, year out cash flow is when uh, you, you, your opening and closing numbers of livestock are the same mm-hmm. at, at the beginning and the end of the year, and your opening and closing uh, value of uh, and quantity of grain is the same. Mm-hmm. So, and all things being equal, a normal year, how much can this business uh, generate as a profit. Mm. Um, and that, that to us is the what, what some people call the acid test. It's the test whether it can actually uh, sustain the debt load, but also whether how much is left in it for you. You know, that's more important. Um, is, is it uh, providing cash services for you in the long term? That's correct. And once you, once you build that average sustainable year in year out cash flow, you can start stress testing it with different commodity prices. So commodity mm. prices at the moment, you know, grains come back to 250. You know, in February we're looking at 350. Uh, but what happens if it goes to 180 or 200? You know, mm. if it goes to long-term international commodity prices, where does it go? And how can your business sustain it? You know, interest rates are cheap at the moment. What happens if they jump two mm. percent? Uh, we get a you know, a vaccine for coronavirus, and and all of a sudden we're 12 months from now, and the world's opened back up. There's a wash of cash there from the from an overflow in, in government spending. Um, and interest rates have to creep up to curb inflation. So all these things are real. Uh, and if you can get to your year in year out cash flow, um, you can start doing some of those stress test things. Mm, that's right. I think it's also flowing onto the next point, Tom. Um, we talked a bit about it, but gaining your confidence in your financial skills and and um, yeah, just it's not just you know once you've got that year in year out model built you can then say okay if the little paddock next door comes up for sale or another farm um could i couldn't i do it you don't have to wait and wonder you, you've already thought it through uh, you've thought through your own business and you've thought well this is a possibility so, mm. and it's just being prepared isn't it yeah um, and the better operators that we see um for some of the better operators they, they do their budgets and, that, and they're always revisiting their budgets and mm. comparing how they've gone to their budget. So they're, they're, they're very attuned to how their business can perform. Uh, and, and you'll see when a lot of people do budgets, sometimes some are too optimistic, some are too conservative. Mm, uh, and I would, I would suggest that you aim to be realistic and aim, aim for what's you know, real, realistically going to happen. It's good to be conservative, but it's also good to be realistic and know what your business can actually achieve. And by comparing your actuals to budget or going through to the last, you know, viewing the last six months and seeing, well, actually we're quite conservative in the way we do our projections. We want to stay that way, but it's good to know that the business typically performs a bit above that. Mm. Or you look back and you go, oh, hang on, I actually spend a little bit more than what I think I'm spending. Um, I'm probably a little bit optimistic about, you know, where my expenses are or what my income yeah, earning capacity is. And I think just that comparing, as you said, Tom, comparing your actuals to your budget 
gives you confidence that you, you're getting good at budgeting skills, mm. you know, that you, you can project forward, you can plan ahead, and you actually, more often than not, you're about right. You know, mm. no one's going to be exactly right, but mm. you, you, you've, um, it gives you that mm. personal confidence that's uh, really, really important. So, yeah. Um, um, and the last one, Benevin, reduce stress and anxiety. Thank his observation, last two years. Yeah. Well, the drought was a very devastating event and we hope we don't see another one like that for a long time. But, you know, the, the, the reality was that people would do a budget and it changed. Um, and it changed every four or five months sometimes. Um, but the people that kept on doing redoing their budgets and they, they were actually doing a feed budget to, to then do their financial budget, if you had livestock, um, they were. I think they felt more in control, Tom. I think mm -hmm. they were a little bit. They were obviously um, stressed by the drought, but they were probably a little bit felt a little bit more in control, and they mm -hmm. had a bit less anxiety about it. Also, mm -hmm. um, there's nothing worse than waking up one day and thinking, "Gee, I've got nothing to feed these stock on," and, mm -hmm. and actually, I have, don't have access to money to do it either. So, um, you would have seen those things as yeah, well, Tom. And likewise, in the, in the cropper's eyes, like the. The cropper who thought, oh, I've got to get a crop in, got to get a crop in, got to make money. So the others, the other guys who said, well, hang on, what happens if I don't put this crop in because I don't have enough subsoil moisture? It doesn't look like it's going to rain. Mm -hmm. How far can the business handle covering its fixed costs mm -hmm. and its financial costs? Yeah. Um, and can we have a discussion with our bank? And we have clients like that who said, you know, 12 months ago, they said, we're not putting a summer crop in because it, it doesn't suit. Um, and they said, we're going to wait through to winter. And we said, okay, that's a long time, but let's look at it. Mm -hmm. And we looked at it and we sorted it out. And that client um, was in a far better position for this year's winter crop. Um, they knew the costs. We all knew the cost that was going to cost to get it through. Um, we sorted that out. And the client was much more relaxed after after we went through that process. Yeah. And the other, other example I can think of, Tom, is uh, where they've um, – Plan ahead to say, well, we need this much feed to, to get through, say, from like, say it was July, and they thought, well, we're not going to get any rain now till the summer, which we didn't, uh, and then we didn't get any anyway. But, um, but it, it meant that they were planning their feed budgets, they had their fun funding in place, and they could buy feed cheaper because they made those decisions a bit sooner, and they could actually and they could actually pay cash for the feed, and yeah. they could probably end up buying a little bit cheaper than people who waited and waited and waited. So. Not to say that you're always going to be right in your assumptions, but um, it's you've got more of a chance of mm. being. Likewise, there's other people who did their feed budget and worked out that it wasn't going to rain until then, and sold all their stock and then bought back in. Mm. Um, you know, we're not going to decision. We're not going to tell you which was the right decision or the wrong decision because it's different for every business and it'll be yeah. different for the next one, as we all know. But doing a doing some more numbers around that just yeah. just helps to make that decision. Yeah. Limitations, Denneman. What's, well, what's the go with that picture? Well, that's a gorgeous picture, that one, isn't it? Of uh, uh, <laughs> Minamara heifers. I think they made about eleven thousand dollars on Friday. Did they? Yes, it was true. No, they're um, not Minamara. <laughs> <laughs> no, we just. I think it's important. It's important to say that um, you can have a pretty picture, and you can have a pretty cash flow budget, uh, and pretty looking cattle, um, but. There's no point in doing all that unless you continue to do the production and timing um, matters on the farm, mm -hmm. you know, when when and when they're due. So, so don't ever get, get us, you know, like as a farmer, you've got a huge variety of skills, more more of a range of skills than nearly any other profession. You've got to be a plumber, you've got to be a nutritionist, you've got to be an agronomist, you've got to be an engineer, and you've probably got to do some budgets. So that's a pretty big job. but. The important thing is uh, we're not trying to diminish those other physical activities that have to occur on time mm. to make money, Like, but this is just the planning before you do it. Yeah, so, um, exactly. Um, and we, you know, some businesses we know absolutely overachieve their budgets yeah. and others get the same, have the same limitations in resources, you know, area cropping and don't achieve the same outcome. And why is that? And it all comes back down to production and timing of management mm. decisions and you know how well that farmer manages that business and that's why we get other business other other farmers who don't do cash flows and run a very profitable business um and and there is instances of that and it's because they know the cash flow in their head and they they have their production and time and mm. management decisions down to a t 
Um, so yeah, cash flow is a is, is a management tool. Yeah. Um, but there's no guarantee it'll make you more money. No, that's right. But it might help. It definitely helps. <laughs> gross margin analysis, Denovan. Yeah. So I guess the th the thing on that time, of course, is that it's not a gross margin analysis. Uh, or cash flow budget is not a gross margin analysis. So uh, obviously we have uh, some of our clients can grow a whole lot of different winter and summer crops, um, and they really um, spend a lot of time working out which is the most profitable crop. So you need to do that first before you then put that into your timing in your cash flow budget. And that's um, a key. So mm. we can't, you know, cash flow budget isn't going to tell you which crop to grow or which mm. type of animal to breed, um, yeah. but it's going to, yeah, it's a different tool. Yeah, the gross margin analysis determines your profit drivers in your business. Um, and the cash flow works out your cash and what, what cash it generates, but it doesn't tell you, um, you know, running trade steers as opposed to running a cow and calf operation as opposed to putting in a winter crop, mm. um, which one's going to generate you more income? The thing, thing also is that um, cropping is a relatively easy thing to do on a gross margin analysis, like um, which is which is great. But for livestock, it's much harder because often we have a three-year production period. Uh, and so you've got to try and work out some kind of mechanism if you're comparing cropping with livestock as to what's the annual annualised return from your livestock, because often it's over a three-year period, and that, that's, that's right. quite hard to do, to be honest. But um, mm. but you've got to really have a go at it because um, you're trying to work out what's the best way to use your, right. your time and money. Yeah, you know, the genetics you invest in this year, the bull genetics you invest in this year, mm. quite dearly, mm. um, you, you, you won't get a return from them for three years. Yeah. Um, and then you'll only get a proportion of return depending on the size of your herd. So it's very hard to do that gross margin analysis, but you need to have it. Have a go. Yeah, definitely. Uh, point in time snapshot, Denver. Um, what was that one time? It was just when um, we're just saying a cash flow budget is just for a 12 month period. So it's mm. not, um, it's it's just. It's not your full business plan. Like, unless you do a year in, year out, or do three years of cash flows, like, like it's part of the tool, but it's the point in time snapshot. So it's not, it, if, if your cash flow budget for your next 12 months, that was, that was what you're going to make all your decisions on purchasing a property. Or, or rebuilding stock, or you know, swapping swapping your enterprise mix up. I would say mm -hmm. you, you're probably underdoing it because one, you haven't got a year in year out. You haven't got your business plan. Where do you want to go? You know, what are you, what's your goals and visions of your business? What's your strategic yeah. moves? That's right. It's not a strategy. It's it's really just showing the banker how much money it needs for the next twelve months. Yeah, that's right. And I think yeah, you you brought this point up, Tom. That it's not about it doesn't provide you. Uh, an assessment of your net worth. So obviously there's money you will spend on many, most years on the farm that will attribute value to the value of the property or the productivity of the property and therefore most likely the value of the property. So um, so you could be spending money on repairs and maintenance or different items that um, are actually a net cost in your business, but then they're really generating uh, a higher value of the asset. Mm -hmm. um, so it's only one part of the whole puzzle. Yeah. Um, Exactly. So, and you might trim back all those costs to to really boost up your profit line at the end. But if you do that after four or five years, then all your fences start falling down, your cattle get out, or you, or you, or, you, or your header doesn't start that year because you've kept it for too long. Um, well, then you start running the costs that way. So, like the cash flow doesn't show that, and you and and you obviously most people are aware of that. Yeah. But um, yeah. there's something to be mindful of. Yeah, so the cash flow, the year in your own cash flow will help to provide you with a, a figure of what might be your annual return on capital. Um, but the, of course, the other equation is uh, looking after your capital, looking after your property, and it, it's going up in value too. So often people earn more or a similar amount in capital gain at a time as opposed mm. to just annual return. So I think both are important. Yeah. So just some... Um just some locations and where you can find some budget resources. I know I had a quick look online myself and just to, just to see what free online cash flow templates there are for farming. Um, well, I think the best one is the Curider uh, cash flow template. So that's the Queensland Rural Industry Development Authority uh, template. Uh, so if you go to their website and look up their loan applications, you'll find one. I think it's the best one. The Regional Investment Corporation, which are doing a lot of drought loans at the moment, they have one as well. They don't have a good breakdown on um, on your expenses. They've got them all grouped together, so it's a lot harder. I think uh, the Q Rider one's probably the best. 
uh, if you're looking at doing your actuals to budget on a more regular basis um, and, and that reporting, um, you can, like people build, build their own cash flows and their own templates on their own spreadsheets, and we see some of them being the best as well. Um, so it depends on how you want to do it, but there is, you know, common accounting software programs out there that that, that have agricultural um, cash flow tools as well. The two, I'll just name the two most common ones that we see. Um, so Ag Data and, or Phoenix, that's that's the one that people had for a long time, and uh, Zero um, and Figured. Uh, well, figured is the cash flow part of zero, um, is becoming more and more prominent mm. these days. Um, you know, there's apps that are helping people manage livestock and there's, uh, there's some sort of apps that are helping cash flow, but you've got to remember the cash flow is a projection as well and you're going to recast it. So you could spend three weeks on it if you wanted to uh, and then it doesn't rain in November and then it completely changes. So you sort of, mm. it's, it's a point in time, you, you, you're making a projection, you will have to recast it. Um, any cash flow that hits the number um, where, you know, the assumptions, your rainfall assumptions, are they come now and map out as you expected them to be until 30 June next year, like how many years has that happened? So you, you most likely will be recasting it, so don't make it too complicated. But those those accounting software programs, they will save you time if you want to do your actual to budget because your, your books mm. are going into that. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, so Q and A, thank you very much. Uh, one thing we will mention: don't forget your budget assumptions that accompany your cash flow. So if you're presenting your cash flow to your financier and your banker, make sure that you come prepared with the assumptions around that, i.e., yields, uh, and comparing that to your average yields. Um, you know, livestock weight gains, uh, what you're selling them for, mm -hmm. and and make sure that that's that's come with some assumptions rather than just a whole number. So rather than just putting you know four hundred thousand dollars in there for livestock sales. What's what's built that up? Yeah. So what are the components? What's the average weight price per kilo you've assumed? Um, and um, like normally for our clients, we'll also go into what market. Like you work, you work it from the end backwards. So um, what market are you aiming at, and, and uh, what are the assumptions behind that? So that's that's uh, like as an agricultural bank, that's something we we always like to know. Um, yeah. Can't is there anything else that you'd like to? Do you want to go through that livestock schedule quickly? Yeah, I think, um, well, firstly, thank you for doing that. That's really, really um, good, and I really appreciate the time of you doing it. So <laughs> um, the thing that I probably want to emphasise and, and why I wanted to do it in the first place is that, like, all of these different things that you can incorporate into your business, like Denim had said, there's so many aspects to being a farmer, but if you can nut down the ones that will provide a little bit more value and take the time to emphasise that. So a cash flow budget is a snapshot in time, but it's 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 giving you confidence in your management to you know if they're like in you know to manage things such as drought events or that like having that access to um, giving you the opportunity to manage your enterprise a little bit more in a detailed way, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, if you could provide three key messages on this, what would you say? Uh, well, I'll try one message. Don't be afraid of a cash flow budget. Um, it sounds daunting to start with, but when you really get to it, it's quite a, it's just a mathematical, this income minus expenses, isn't it? So, uh, and, and when is it roughly going to happen? So it's daunting to start with. Um, we often, um, uh, with clients that haven't done cash flow budgets before, we would uh, perhaps try and do one together for the first few times mm -hmm. and just help them on their way. Um, but it's it's just like anything, until you actually start and get into it, um, it sounds awful thing to do, but it's um, a very important skill. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would say um, like doing a cash flow budget is all about that part of your business where you're working on top of your business as opposed to working in your business. Mm -hmm. So so that management part of your business and, and we always get stuck in what we're doing every day. And we you know we've got a thousand things to do, you got to check heifers, you've got to spray this paddy, you've got to shear these sheep. Um, you know, it's all part of your management decision. And yeah, you, know, you, you hear it time and again, you know, twenty percent of your time should be on your management part of your business. So this should be incorporated into that, into that twenty percent. Because you can look back and reflect, um, you can make some decisions, strategic decisions about your business for the next 12 months, and then if you go deeper, you know what you're doing longer term. Mm. Um, 
and 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 it's as, it is as important as spraying that next paddock, really. Mm. I think if, I will often say, um, like, you've got to have a strategy and you've got to have a plan for the year ahead, which this is more the plan for the year ahead. Uh, the strategy is longer term. But um, work out what you've got to work hard at, not just working harder mm. as a general thing. Like, work hard at the right things. And that's that's how people are successful. I, we, when we recorded live, um, I just asked Denovan and Tom a question because sometimes like in the cropping world, it's probably a little bit easier to, to form a cash flow budget because your finances are probably a little bit more structured. Um, when it becomes to livestock, it's, it's not as structured and, and you have got, I suppose, you've got this time factor when it comes if you're a breeding enterprise as compared to a trading enterprise there's all these different factors that come into play. So you know, like you've explained, cash flow budgets may not be as easy. Are you able to just run through a quick example on things that people could be mindful of mm. um, with this spreadsheet, I guess? Yeah, definitely, Kate. So this is a um, – I plugged a few numbers in here uh, before last Thursday, and this is a three-year livestock schedule for a breeding enterprise that's come out of the drought with um, carving down – uh, 250 cows and 50 heifers um, and wants to build back up to about 400. Um, so I'm just trying to show you um, what sort of happens to this business and when do they get to their peak income. And, what, you know, we're talking about, oh, you know, three years build up, four years build up, five years build up, you know, before we're back at our sustainable, you know, sort of peak production for a cattle business, which does take time because a cow can only have one calf a year. Um, and cattle are deer, so we don't want to spend too much money on them. So in this instance, we've got 250 cows um, carving down, 50 heifers. Um, so we're getting 270 progeny um, this this spring, um, and we want to build back up to 400. So in this scenario, we're buying 100, um, 100 empty cows uh, for $1,500. So we're going to join approximately 400 cattle um, well, a bit over 400 by the time we bring our young heifers on. Uh, 400 and well, we've got 374, 440 uh, this spring. Uh, and this probably answers the question a little bit around what bull sales are doing this year because everyone's like, oh, there's no cattle around. Why bull so dear? Well, if you talk, and I've talked to a few clients, um, they might be understocked at the moment, but a lot of them are joining their sustainable carrying numbers this year. So, if they're, you know, they, in this instance, we're joining 440 females uh, this spring or you know, later on this spring um, and we're carving down it and hopefully getting 390 to 400 calves uh, next year. But the income from those calves, uh, and this is a, uh, an operation that sells onto feedlots or, or sells you know, to Woolworths in the second year, the income for this 392 isn't going to come to our year three. So in this instance, we've got the income of the 270 coming through um, in the second year, so they're earning four hundred twenty thousand dollars in the second year, but their peak income's not starting until year three. So, if you're not joining um, your peak cattle numbers as what you know, your sustainable cattle numbers as where you see your business sustainably holding this year, and you're not joining them till next year, well, you're not going to get your peak income or your, yeah, your peak optimal income until year four because it's going to take another year before those calves are hitting the ground and then another year before you sell them. So it's just uh, something to be aware of and a, and a good place to start for a um, for a livestock operation is on the is on the um, livestock schedules mm. and to follow those through and see what happens. I mean, you could, you could pull this out and you say, well, I don't have $150,000 to buy 100 cows. So you pull that out. Um, and then we just look through here and... Well, I'd have to play and I'd have to touch these numbers up. But you know, instead of having 397 carbs or 392 carbs next year, we only got 304. So then we've got, you know, and then you're holding back female progeny to rebuild your old numbers, sustain uh, you know, throughout through your herd. Uh, and it, and you'll probably find if you're if you're saving the low base and you want to rebuild them through your own herd and just keep your females, if you if you track that through, it might take you five or six years to get to your peak number. And five or six years is a long time. Um, and we all know, well, in a livestock business, profit drivers, one of the key profit drivers is, is number of kilos produced per year. And that's essentially what's happening to your business. Because you've got less females, you're having less calves, you're producing less kilos. Um, you know, so someone who goes and buys 
females in, yes, they've got a capital cost up front, but their profitability over the next four or five years will be far greater than the person who waits to breed their numbers up um, because they're producing more kilos quicker, even though they've got a you know high commitment because they've had they've had to outlay that that yeah. cost to start with. So cash flow in those two scenarios, you could do that fairly easily with this sort of program uh, to work out when your maximum debt is and mm. obviously you're going to have more interest cost in buying stock up front, but um, just working out yeah, where your peak debt would be uh, and, um, and are you comfortable with that level of debt too is an important yeah. factor. That's right. I hope that helps answer your question there, Kate. Yes, that's good. Thank you. Um, well, that will be all, and hopefully this is our last take of the webinar. Um, I really appreciate, again, your time um, in this, and I hope people watching found value. And for those who watch live, um, yeah, if you, you hopefully you found value in watching it again. So, um, yeah, thanks for your time. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I'm sure I could pass them on um, and yeah, thank you. No problem at all. It's a pleasure.